Good evening, good, sorry, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you uh, all here. I'm always encouraged to see uh, my brothers and sisters who've made it back for another opportunity to worship on a Sunday evening, ready to worship and to uh, stir up love and good works like the Bible says that we should. Uh, you could be home watching football right now. The season just started. Today's the first day. You could be home taking a nap. Um, I'm tired. I'm sure many of you also are as well, but you're here, and uh, for that, you should be commended. This past week, I was asked a question that most of us have asked at at least one point in our lives, or if you haven't asked it, you probably heard someone ask a question similar to it. My friend asked me, why did God create lions, tigers, and alligators? What was their perfect purpose? And to me, I think this is an excellent question, one that deserves an answer uh, for someone that is seeking a deeper understanding of who God is and what God does and why God does it. Uh, in answering my friend's question, I recall a time that I was at Central Florida Bible Camp. Uh, this, this is a camp that's run by the church up in Eustis, Florida, up in Lake County. And uh, on this occasion, my cabin mates and I, we were walking through the woods and on a particularly hot and humid Florida day, um, in July, not only was I hot, but the bugs were out and were making themselves known. Um, as we were walking, the mosquitoes, they were, you know, greeting us, they were kissing us on our arms and our legs, and I couldn't help myself. I, I, I you know, wondered out loud, very loudly, like, ugh, why did God have to make mosquitoes, right? One of the camp counselors was, was nearby, and she heard my exclamation, and she turned and she very calmly said, God made mosquitoes to remind you that this world is not your home. Boy, did that stop me in my tracks. Uh, not literally, we kept walking, I wanted to get out of the woods. Um, but her words really made an impact on me. I can't remember the theme of camp that year. I don't remember the names of the other boys I was walking with. Um, I, I don't even remember what year that was, I, I couldn't tell you. But anytime I get bit by a mosquito, um, after I angrily scratch the spot that it bit me, I think to myself, this world is not my home. And this evening, I, I want to take a look at a question similar to that question. Why did God make mosquitoes? But I want to look at a larger question, a question that is admittedly more selfish than the question, why did God create lions and tigers and bears? I was waiting for the oh my, okay. <laughs> the question I want to look at tonight is why did God create me? Why did God create you? Why did God create us? We're going to take a look at what the Bible has to say about this question, and hopefully at the end you'll be able to um, have a good answer for yourself and also be able to explain this to your friends because this question is going to come up. Why did God create us? While saying, you know, God created mosquitoes to remind you that this world is not your home, it's a good answer, but it may not provide a satisfying answer to why he created us. Or it doesn't help, it, it may not get to the, the crux of that, the answer to that question, but it does help us get started in the right direction. Right off the bat, if we or if someone else is asking the question, why did God create us? then they're acknowledging something that should not be overlooked as part of this question. They're acknowledging the fact that God is the creator. God is the creator. In order for us to begin to understand why he created us, we first have to understand and acknowledge that he did create us. Not just us, but every single thing that we see. Not just the things that we see, but the things that we can't see that are a part of this universe, God created all of it. All things that have beginnings have causes. The universe had a beginning and therefore the universe had a cause. The cause of the universe had to be outside of the universe. The cause of the universe had to be outside of time and that's where God is. The cause of the universe had to be outside of space itself. The cause of this universe is would have to be something that is not made up of what the universe is made up of, something immaterial. The cause of all things would have to be immensely powerful, infinitely intelligent, and amazingly creative. Just look at the platypus. Just look at it. An animal with a duck bill, a beaver's tail, feet like an otter, it lays eggs, it's a mammal, and it's venomous. Only some, someone 
that is immensely powerful, infinitely intelligent, and amazingly creative could make something like that, turn it into reality, and do so from just his thoughts. God created it all. And so when we think about an all-knowing, all-powerful God, we would expect that his motivations for any action, uh, in many cases, might be unknown to us. Maybe his motivations are outside of our comprehension sometimes. Unless he chooses to tell us, we, we won't know the answer to why God does anything. Uh, consider, if you will, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. God is speaking uh, through his prophet, and he says this. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Is the Lord bragging here? No. No, he's not. He's not bragging when you're simply stating the facts, right? God's relationship is, is much like a, a parent's relationship to, say, a four-year-old. Um, I remember paying for something in a store one time uh, with my debit card. I think the kids were maybe like four or five. And um, one of the kids asked me, are you stealing? Because they didn't see me actually hand a person money. And I explained to them, no, I got this card here. I'm paying with my debit card. So they're asking, well, where's the money? Well, it's in my bank account. And so they're going to take it from my bank account and give it to the store's bank account. And they asked, so all your money's in a bank? Well, yes and no. It's not really there. It's kind of like in the cloud or something like that. Um, and then they asked me, well, how did the money get in there? Did they just scan your money in when you got it at work? If you want to find out how much you don't know about your money, just try to explain a bank account and a debit card to a four-year-old. In a similar way, though, there are things that God has done that we can never fully understand for the simple reason that he is God. For the simple reason that, that he's God, he's done them, but he may not have told us why he has done them. Or perhaps he has told us, and his answer may not give us all the details uh, that our human curiosity might wish for. Uh, consider what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. There he said this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are things that God reveals, and those things that he does reveal to us, we need to hold on to, we need to cherish, we need to share them with our children, we need to follow them. When we search for God's, when we search in God's word for why he created humans, we may find an answer that may leave us, you know, a little bit more curious. But we should understand that God is just so much greater than us. As the creator of the universe, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But nevertheless, uh, I do want to take a look at one reason that God created us and two purposes that he's created us for. Uh, to answer the question, why did God create us, we're going to take a look at the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 9, and I'd like to read for you, and if you'd like to open up your Bibles, Revelation chapter, chapter 4, sorry, Revelation chapter 4, uh, verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. This is the, the vision or revelation given to John of things that would shortly take place. We see that from the first chapter, first verse of this book. And part of this revelation, we see through John some of the inner workings of heaven. And so here we are in, in Revelation chapter 4, um, starting with verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast, down, cast their crowns before the throne, saying, verse 11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So here's an interesting scene. Here we see the Lord being given what is, what is due to him, glory, honor, power, 
The Lord is being worshipped. These elders are around his throne and they're bowing down to the Lord. They're casting their crowns down before him. They're glorifying the Lord. Why? Why are they doing this? Well, they explain why. They say it right there at the end of verse 11. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So why do you exist? Because God willed it. Why do you exist? Because God wanted you to exist. Why do you exist? Because God felt like it. God felt like creating you. Consider Psalm chapter uh, 115 and verse 3. Psalm 115 and verse 3 Where the psalmist says of God, but our God is in heaven, he does whatever he pleases. Our God is in heaven, he does whatever he pleases. You exist because God wanted you to exist. Now this may sound like, you know, a a no-duh answer, like, yeah, of course, we exist because God wanted us to, to exist. He created all things. But we need to stop and think about this a little bit deeper for a moment. I exist because God wanted me to exist. You exist because God wanted you to exist. You are wanted. Have you considered that? You are wanted. Have you ever pondered about this? Every year for the past 25 years or so, the CDC has surveyed high school age children about their feelings. They've asked students to uh, report their feelings of uh, persistent sadness and hopelessness over the course of the last 25 years. And in the early 2000s, about 20% of the students said they had feelings of persistent sadness and hopelessness. 20%. By 2023, that number doubled to 40%. Among the girls, Uh, The percentage that were reporting sadness or hopelessness in the year 2023 was 53%. 53%. So more than half of the girls that are going to wake up tomorrow morning and go to their high schools in this area around us feel sad and hopeless. This increase closely correlates, if you look at graphs, to uh, time spent on social media in a day. And so you can kind of, you know, probably see what's going on here. Our children and many adults are looking at pictures and, and the perfect lives of others and comparing themselves to others. Very quickly, you can see how someone would think to themselves, well, no one's gonna want me if I'm not like this person, or no one's gonna want me if I'm not like this person over here. This constant self-comparison leads to loneliness, leads to sadness, leads to hopelessness. But what do these girls need to hear? What do these high school age boys need to hear? No, what does the whole world need to hear? What they need to hear is that you exist because you were wanted. God wanted you to exist and therefore you exist. God wanted you to exist, and therefore you exist. Again, they said, for the Lord created all things, and by his will we exist and were created. You exist because you were wanted. I uh, very rarely get into political conversations. In fact, I almost go out of my way to avoid um, being in, in those types of conversations. However, I do want to state something as it pertains to the topic at hand. Uh, There is an amendment that's going to appear on the ballot in Florida uh, about abortion. Now, I don't want to go into all the details about this amendment. You're all adults. I do encourage you to go and take a look at this amendment and do your own research on it. But as it pertains to this topic, I will say this. Whether or not your life started as the union of two loving parents, whether or not you started as from the the hideousness of rape or incest, whether or not your mother wanted you, whether or not your father wanted you. If you exist, it's because God wanted you. For you created all things, and by your will, they exist and were created. If a life is formed, it is because God wanted it. 
Whatever God wants, we should keep sacred and keep protected. But before we get too big of a head, understanding that God, that we exist because God wanted us, it should be stated that although God wants us, he doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. Consider what Paul told the people in Athens in Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. There he's at the Areopagus, he's speaking, and he says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life breath in all things. God doesn't need me, and he doesn't need you. What does he say in Psalm chapter 50, verses 10 through 12? Psalm 50, 10 through 12, there it says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine in all its fullness. God created us because he wanted to, not because he needed to. And, you know, this is, this is actually a, a very powerful thing to, to think about. You know what this is like? This is like the, the mother that gets a call from a child that usually only calls when they need something, right? So when the mother picks up the phone, they, they might be thinking, oh, what's now? What's going on? You know, what do you need? But when that child stops and says, nothing, I don't need anything, Mom. I just called because I wanted to talk. How do you think that mother feels? When someone says, hey, I, I want to take you out, and you ask them, well, why? It's nowhere near my birthday. Why, why do you want to take me out? And the person says, well, I, I just want, want to hang out with you. How does that make you feel? <laughs> it feels good to be needed sometimes. It also feels good to be wanted sometimes. But I would submit to you this evening that it feels even better to be wanted without need. God has need of nothing. He does not need me. He doesn't need you but he wanted me. He wanted you, and so he made you, and he made me. So that brings us back to the question at hand. Why did God create us? Because he wanted to. God created us because he wanted to. That leads us to you know, the next logical question, though. If God made us because he wanted to and not because he needed to, what are we here for? That's a good question. What is our purpose? I want to consider a few verses from the book of Isaiah and then a verse from the book of Colossians. First, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7 says this, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Dropping down to verse 21 of the same chapter, God through the prophet says, this people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise. Going to the New Testament, let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, in describing Jesus and his many attributes, Paul says this about Jesus in verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So what are we created for? We're created for God's glory. We're created for God's glory, to glorify him. That is why we're created. That's exactly what we see in that, that first passage that we read in the book of Revelation. The elders were there, they were bowing down, they were throwing their crowns down before the throne of God. They were worshiping him, they were giving him the glory that he was due. Now this fact may, may cause some to think, okay, maybe this implies that God is some egotistical dictator who simply created subjects to grovel at his feet and just tell him how great he is. Some may be tempted to think that way. But this line of reasoning fails to fully grasp what God's glory 
is all about. Not only are humans designed to bring glory to God, we're also designed to enjoy God's glory and to find our own completeness in it. God, by his glory and his goodness, provides so much for us. While God does not need us, he certainly provides for our needs, does he not? While there are times that we have turned our backs on God and we live like we don't want him, he wanted us from the beginning. And he still supplies us with much of what we want, even more than what we need. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 says this, We love him because he first loved us. And I believe the same can be said about God's glory. We glorify him because he first bestowed his glory on us. Let me illustrate this. My my birthday was on Wednesday. If you want to know how old I am, you can ask Brother David how old he is and cut his age in half. Sorry, David. Happy birthday, by the way. (laughs) But for my birthday, my wife and kids, they, uh, they wrote down reasons that they love me on sticky notes. And they put it on, uh, we have a large mirror in our living room, and they put it all over the mirror. So when I got home from work, they were all really excited. Hey, go read this. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, they wrote things like, I love you because you take us on walks. Uh, I love how you dance and play music with Maxwell. I love you because you play Legos with us. Now, I don't go on walks or play you know, music with Maxwell or uh, play with Legos because I'm an egotistical monster that's looking for praise. No, I, I do all of those things out of love for my family. And at the same time, you know, no one forced my family to uh, write nice things about me on sticky notes. At least I hope no one did. No, they, they, they wrote those things out of a love for me. And this is how our relationship is with God. He created us because he wanted to. He created us for his glory. He willingly gives of himself to us, and so we in turn reciprocate that and praise him and glorify him for what he has done for us. The same way that my family showed me how much they loved me. This is what we do with God. This is one of our purposes, to glorify him. I'd like to read two more verses that talks about another purpose that God has uh, made us for. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, Paul writes to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verses uh, 13 through 14, there he, writes to Pilate, uh, there he writes to Titus, he says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. God is good and we are created in his image. Therefore, God created us to do good works. God created us to be zealous for good works. God created us to be like him, to be constantly seeking ways to be of service to our fellow man or our fellow woman. Good works is our purpose because God is the definition of good. Psalm chapter 145 and verse 9 says this. Psalm 145 verse 9 The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. God is good, and so we are to be good as his creation. Let's close the lesson out. Why did God create us? Because he could. He alone has the power, the intelligence, the creativity to be able to make you. Why did God create you? Because he wanted you to exist. What a wonderful thing to think about. Because he created us, what is our purpose? To reciprocate the glory that he has by glorifying him with our lives. What is one way that we can do that? By being zealous to do good works. 
I think this whole topic can be wrapped up by the words of Samuel on the day of Saul's coronation as the first king of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 24, Samuel reminded the people there. He said, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. You exist because God wanted you to exist. Are you glorifying him with your life? Are you working zealously for him because of him? If not, then why not? If anyone here this evening would like prayers of the church for any need, or if there's uh, anyone here tonight that would like to put on Christ in baptism, we stand ready to serve you this evening. Please come forward as we stand and as we sing.